No, God is good, isn't he? We've heard testimony of his grace and his goodness. But who knows there's a whole world of difference between knowing of someone and knowing someone. I don't know if it's still the same thing on Facebook, but you used to have this thing where people used to say, well, how many friends have you got on Facebook? And people would proudly pronounce they've got 500, 750, 1,000 friends on Facebook. But the reality is you may know of those people, but you probably know very few of them in a real and personal way. You know, this morning, maybe you're here and you've heard of this person called Jesus. You know of, but yet your experience is that you do not know him this morning. You know, one way of getting to know somebody is to hear what they have to say. You know, what do they say about themselves? What do other people say about them? And in the New Testament, Jesus himself declared seven I am statements. Statements about who he is. Statements such as, I am the bread of life, I am the light, I am the door, I am the good shepherd, I am the resurrection and the life, I am the vine. But this morning I want to come to one of Jesus' I am statements, which you will know, and it's this, that I am the way, the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. This verse is found in the Gospel of John, chapter 14. And if you were to turn there in your Bibles, we'll just refer to it in a little bit. But there's an awful lot going on at this particular point in time as we arrive at John, chapter 14. It's the Last Supper, the preparations for the Last Supper, the Passover meal. Jesus had just declared this wonderful act of service by washing his disciples' feet despite the fact they didn't want him to do it. It's the time when Jesus says that, Judas, you're going to betray me. It's the time when Jesus is unpacking the fact that he needed to go and they could not come with him. It was a time when he was telling them that he needed to go to the cross. He needed to fulfill the Father's work, which led him to the cross, to die on that cross. But aren't we glad he rose on the third day and salvation is ours because of what Jesus did. It's also a time where he predicts Peter's denial of him before the cock throws three times. You shall deny me, Peter. So just imagine all of that going on in a very short period of time. The disciples must have been in this position of anxiety and fear and worry. Jesus, the one that they had followed for so long, has just told them that he's going. He's no longer to be there. That one amongst them is going to betray him. Another one amongst them is going to deny him. All this emotion, all this fear, all this worry must have come across them at that time. But then we enter this scripture in John 14 where Jesus says these words to his disciples. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. So at a moment when maybe his disciples ought to have been comforting Jesus, because he just revealed he's going to go to the cross and die, Jesus ends up comforting his disciples because they were in fear, they were in worry, they were in anxiety of what was yet to come. And then Jesus goes on from verse 2 and says these words, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. So in all this confusion, all this anxiety, all this fear, Jesus brings these wonderful words of comfort. Verse 4, Jesus says to him, you know the way to the place where I am going. But Thomas replied and said, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? You know, Thomas gets a bad rap in the Bible, doesn't he? He's known as Doubting Thomas, but actually he's the one that probably asked the question that everybody else wanted the answer to. 
Has anybody been in a meeting and somebody, some clever clogs is explaining something, they're using all these acronyms, whatever, you're having a foggy what they're saying. And you're so pleased when some brave person puts up their hand and says, excuse me, what did you actually mean by that? And they explain it. I've been in Bible college this week, so I've experienced that quite a few days. I'm going to foggy what they're going on about, but they explain it well. Thomas asked the question nobody else wanted to ask, but everybody wanted to know this answer. And then Jesus replies to Thomas's question this. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You see, Jesus in this moment is confessing absolutes. He doesn't say, I am a way. I am a version of truth. He says, I am the way, the truth, the life. And you know, at the time, that statement offended the religious leaders. And you know, even in today's society, that statement can be quite offensive. Because we live in a world, don't we, that promotes self. You know, when it's okay, I'll find my version of the truth. I'll live my life. I'll find my version. And once I've found my version of the truth, you know what? You'll have to live with my version, and that's okay. But the reality, that is not what it's about. Because Jesus is declaring in this moment there is only one way. It's an offensive statement. Because we are proclaiming something that's exclusive. That the only way to the Father is through Jesus. But do you know what? Even though it may be an exclusive route, it's an inclusive invitation. Because in 1 Timothy, it says this. This is good and pleases God our Savior. Who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. You see, God's desire is for all people to come to know him and be saved. God's heart is for the salvation and the reconciliation of every single individual. Regardless of background circumstances, God extends his love, his his desire, his mercy, his grace to each and every one of us. That's why he sent his son Jesus his one and only begotten son, because he wanted to reconcile this gap between himself and humanity. So it may well be exclusive, yes, and we stand on that truth. There is only one way to the Father, and that is through Jesus Christ. But the invitation is open to everyone to come to know him as their Lord And as their saviour. So what does it mean that Jesus is the way? You see, Jesus here was expressing that he is the exclusive path to God the Father. And Jesus is the only way humanity can be reconciled to God and receive eternal life. He is saying that he is the embodiment of that truth and salvation. There is no plan B. God made plan A, and his name was Jesus. And it's him that we come to. Jesus was emphasizing the faith in him, faith in his sacrificial death on the cross, was the only way to be restored in relationship to God. He is the mediator between God and humanity, providing the forgiveness of our sins. And following Jesus, you know, involves more than just an intellectual belief. It requires a commitment for us, for Jesus to be our Lord and our Savior, to follow his word, to follow his truth. You know, way before Christians were called Christians, there were simply those that called those that followed the way. When Saul was out to, to capture them and put them in prison in Acts 9 verse 2, they just called those that followed the way. The way being Jesus, because Jesus was the embodiment of the way to the Father. Are you following the way this morning? Are you following the one who calls himself the way? He also calls himself the truth, 
I am the truth, Jesus declares, because Jesus is the embodiment of absolute truth. Jesus is the perfect revelation of God's character. Occasionally I have these odd thoughts. I wonder what it would be like if God was in heaven and he was to take a selfie. What would that picture look like? Now, so I know some of you like your, your selfie photographs <laughs> and your, your poses. But I think if God was in heaven, he was to take a photograph, that representation would be Jesus. That representation would be Jesus. In Hebrews, it says the sun, which is Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. His teaching, his word, he alone can provide true understanding and knowledge of God, salvation, and the purpose of life. He came to reveal the truth of our sinful condition, the need to repent and to turn to him. That is the absolute truth that Jesus reveals. But he doesn't just offer us a physical life, but a spiritual life also. And an abundant life that is only found in him. He's the one that gives purpose, fulfillment, identity. Identity and joy that extends beyond this earthly existence. Because through faith in him we receive the forgiveness of our sins and the promise of eternal life. Do we get an amen to that this morning? The gospel of Jesus Christ. Because apart from Jesus, there is a spiritual death. There is a spiritual darkness. And we're separated from God. It's only Jesus that brings the light into the darkness. He's the only way to be reconciled to God. But following Jesus as our life involves us surrendering our lives to him, receiving, yes, this gift of salvation and an eternal life, but obeying his teaching and obeying his word. It's a call to a deep, intimate relationship with the living God. Wow. But how do we find the way to the one that calls himself the way. We've heard some stories of that this morning. But Jesus himself, in six words, said this. If we want to find our way to the way, repent and believe the good news. That is the way to the one that calls himself the way. Repent. Quite an old-fashioned word. Maybe we don't hear about it so much. But it literally means just Turn away from the way you're going and go the way that God wants you to go. Turn your heart and your mind to him. Take it off yourself and turn to him and follow him. Believe. Well, how do we believe? Well, we have faith to believe that Jesus is indeed the son of God. That he went to the cross. He died, but yet on the third day he rose again. That's the good news of Jesus Christ. So Jesus is saying the way to the way is very simple in that respect. Repent and believe the good news. Has anybody here ever been lost? Hands up. Wow. Great. I don't feel so bad. Because I've got a terrible sense of direction. Anybody jumped in a car and you've gone somewhere and you've taken the wrong turn and for whatever moments later you are totally and completely and utterly lost. You know, I often get lost when I go out running. I think I've got a great sense of direction. I can read maps. I cannot. Um, I I sort of picture in my mind, I think where I'm going to go, but I don't end up there and I end up getting totally lost. There was an occasion in in Paris recently when we went on our holiday. I thought I'd run out to the Paris Saint-Germain Stadium we were staying in the suburbs of Paris. I studied the map very quickly in the foyer of the hotel, and it said, right, I turn left out the door. I run for five, six miles up to, the, up to the river. When I get to the river, I take another left, and it's probably about two miles on the right-hand side. So I thought, great, 
I'll go for a morning run. Off I went, five minutes running. Some doubts just started to creep in my mind. Am I going in the right direction? Ignored them, carried on. 15 minutes, 20 minutes, thoughts came back again. It ain't looking like I'm heading towards a football stadium. Okay, carry on. Anyway, 25, 35, 45 minutes, 50 minutes, an hour into the run, I thought, you know, I've had all these feelings that I'm heading in the wrong direction. I'm going to stop and I'm going to try and figure out exactly where I am. So everybody does the thing, they get out the phone, you put on the maps, you see that little blue spot that arrives on your map, and then you do this. <laughs> ah, I've just ran for an hour in completely the wrong direction. <laughs> what I found out when we went back to the, 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 the hotel foyer was that I read the map upside down. I should have... T- <laughs> I should have taken a right as I came out of the hotel and I would have found the stadium. It was a wasted morning. Oh. And there's another occasion. Running the Malvern Hills. I've run the Malvern Hills quite a bit now. I know the route. It's fantastic. I know exactly where I'm going. Up to the summit, along the ridge, back to a little village, back round again. Brilliant. A couple of months ago, I was running the, the Malvern Hills. I got to the summit. Then all of a sudden, this fog started to sort of descend on me. It started to get dark, and literally within a few moments, I'd lost my orientation completely. I had no idea where I was. So I thought, don't worry about it, I'll just go back the way that I came. I thought I could navigate my way back off the, off the hill. So off I went, walking down the hill, but I ended up actually descending the hill from a completely different side. I ended up actually coming off completely the other side, literally miles and miles and miles away from where I was supposed to be. Now, don't tell my wife this, right? Oh, she's listening. On that occasion, I didn't take my phone with me. Now, she said to me, if I went out running without my phone, she'd break my legs. So, but I went out running, I didn't take my phone, so I had no idea, but I ended up on a path that I did not expect to end up. And you know, the Paris experience can be a little bit like our lives. That we're heading in a direction. We're not too sure where we're going, but we know we're just heading. Whether it's career, family, money, whatever it may be, we're sort of living life in this sort of direction. And we know there's times when those little nags come in our mind, am I going the right way? Has God put me on the right path? Is there more to life than what I'm experiencing? And maybe you put those to the side and you just keep on going. Maybe you can empathize with how the disciples were feeling. Anxious and fearful and worried, just not knowing what's life going to be like without Jesus. We're following him, he's just not there. And maybe you'll say, you know, I know of this Jesus, but I actually don't really know him. I believe God wants to speak to you this morning. And he wants to say exactly the same thing to you as he said to his disciples. Don't let your heart be troubled. For I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And maybe that's your experience. You know you don't know this Jesus. You know of him. But what you've sensed in this place this morning through testimony and whatever, you just know there's something. I would love to know who this Jesus is. I'm going to give you the opportunity to respond to that invitation in a short while. But maybe you're more like my Malvern experience. Because you're the ones that actually have known the way. Or the one that has called himself the way. But for whatever reason, something's come in your experience. A dark moment, a fog moment where you've lost your way. And if you were honest with yourself this morning, you'd say that actually I'm in a place where I don't know how I got here. I believe God wants to speak to you this morning with these words also. Do not let your heart be troubled. For I am still the way, the truth, and the life. Come home. Come home. 
because I am still the way. You once knew me as the way, I am still the way. Come home. <laughs> I wonder if you just close your eyes for a moment. So I think it's important that we respond to God's word. And even if you're a follower of Jesus, maybe there's a question we need to answer for ourselves. Is Jesus still the way, the truth, and the life in every situation in your life? If he's not, invite him in. Whatever you're facing at this moment, invite him in and let him be known as the way, the truth, and the life. But this morning, I just want to give an opportunity for maybe those that have never asked Jesus to come into their life. This morning you've said, you know what, I want to make Jesus my way. I want him to be the one that I follow. I'm going to pray a, a short prayer. And if that's you, just pray this prayer in your heart. And after I've prayed it, I'll just ask you to indicate that you've prayed it. The prayer goes like this. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I know I am a sinner, but I ask for forgiveness. I believe you died and rose again. I turn from my life and invite you into my heart. I acknowledge that you are indeed the way, the truth, and the life. And I will follow you as my Lord and Savior. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with your eyes still closed, please, will you just raise your hand? It's just a way of acknowledging those that have given a commitment to Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. God is good. What about those that may be here this morning that would say, you know what, I knew the way but I'm lost I want to make him the way again I want to come home if that's you just raise your hand this morning as a way of acknowledging him Amen 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 God is good God is good Amen. So dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for your word. We want to thank you, Lord, that you are indeed the way, the truth, and the life. As we commit our ways to your ways, Father God, I pray that we will draw close to you, that we will seek you out, that we indeed will make you the way of our lives. Amen.